بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد سيد الأولين والآخرين وعلى جميع إخوانه من النبيين والمرسلين وآل كل وصحب كل ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا رب العالمين All praise is due to Allah and may Allah raise the rank of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and protect his nation from that which he fears for them We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase our knowledge and benefit us with the knowledge we have acquired. Ameen. In our lesson tonight, we'll be continuing talking about the prophetic immigration of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We mentioned before that the reason for this event was to establish a ground for Muslims in Medina so they can be well structured and to start from there. Because in Mecca they were unable to make such a firm establishment since the Prophet and the believers were oppressed by the non-believers. They used to torture the companions and the followers of the Prophet ﷺ. Some were lashed, some were thrown in the desert on the hot sand as a punishment with a big rock on the chest to deter them from following the Prophet ﷺ. But they were as firm as huge mountains. Allah gave them the power, the support, and they remained steadfast. They tried to hurt the Prophet ﷺ in different ways. In one of the incidents, one person called Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt, he was one of the figures of the blasphemers in Mecca. He harmed the Prophet a lot. Once the Prophet ﷺ was making sujood before the Kaaba, then this person, Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt, approached him. He wrapped his clothes around his neck and tried to choke the Prophet ﷺ. Then Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu came and pushed him away and said to him, Are you killing a man for just telling you Allah is my Lord? They also tried to throw on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam some filthy things and the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam was steadfast. They tried to put the believers under siege for three years and they were steadfast. So they tried different means of torturing, harming and other things. And the Prophet ﷺ and the believers were steadfast. To the extent that his uncle Abu Talib approached the Prophet with an offer from the non-believers, telling him, O oh my nephew, here is an offer from your people. If you want, for the sake of giving up your call, Money, they can collect money for you until you become the richest amongst them. 
If you want to be a king, they will appoint you as a king for the tribe. If you want a social status, they will give it to you. So they won't do anything without consulting with you. But we all know that the Prophet ﷺ did not want from his cause any worldly matter, any position in the tribe or any money and the like. So his answer was to his uncle, oh my uncle, if they were to place the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left in order for me to give up this call, I won't do it until I die for its sake or Allah Azza wa Jal will grant me victory. The Sahaba of the Prophet والسلام, remained steadfast despite the immense harm that was inflicted on them from the non-believers. Take as an example Ammar ibn Yasir, whose parents were killed in front of his eyes for the sake of him leaving this da'wah, and he didn't do it. Until the order from Allah Azza wa Jal came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to order the believers to immigrate to Medina. Between Mecca and Medina is about 450 kilometers. They started immigrating. Some went walking that distance in the heat of the desert. Some were on their camels and the like. But they rushed to fulfill that order of Allah because it was an obligation. So the immigration of the Prophet ﷺ was not looking for fame or money, wealth or a worldly matter. Rather, it was to fulfill the order of Allah جل, and to make a firm establishment for this nation in Medina. They started immigrating one by one, a smaller group, a larger group, and so on, to reach Medina. When the non-believers realized that the Prophet والسلام, is sending the believers to Medina, and he had already some supporters called Al-Ansar in Medina, they got worried. They held a meeting and they discussed this manner. Everyone started giving his opinion. Some said, we'll kill him. Then others replied, we cannot fight all the clans of Abd Manaf, that's from the tribe of the Prophet Some said, let us exile him. Others said, if we do so, he can quickly convince people to follow him. So soon he will have a huge army that he won't be able to fight. Until Abu Jahl, this devilish person, came up with an idea. He said, let us bring from each tribe a strong young man, they can all go to his house. As he's leaving his house, they hit him with their swords, one hit, and they kill him. His blood will be scattered amongst all those tribes. Then the clan of Abdul Manaf won't be able to fight all of them, so they will accept the indemnity. But Allah Azza wa Jal informed the Prophet through Jibreel alayhi salam about their plotting. And Jibreel told the Prophet not to sleep in his bed and to instruct Ali bin Abi Talib, his cousin, to sleep in his place. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam headed to leave his house. Upon doing this, those young men were already outside his house waiting for the Prophet to walk out. But the Prophet ﷺ started reciting Surah Yaseen until he reached the verse, فَأَغْشَيْنَاهُمْ فَهُمْ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ So we made them unable to see the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet took a handful of dirt from the ground 
He started reciting these verses and he sprinkled the dirt on their heads as he was walking amongst them. Then he went to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Abu Bakr was preparing for that journey because whenever he used to ask the Prophet to give him permission to leave to Medina, the Prophet used to say to him, wait, you might have a good companionship. And he used to say to the Prophet, I ask you to be your companion in that journey. So he was well equipped and ready for that trip. He already had his servant, Amr ibn Fuhayra, and he had a guide, Abdullah ibn Urayqit. They agreed with him that he will meet them and he will take them. He knows the routes to Medina and in which way to go. And they went to the coast, so they took the coastal line instead of the normal way to Medina, just to make the non-believers unable to reach them. Until they went to that cave called the Cave of Saul. But the non-believers were approached by someone who were outside the house of the Prophet. And he said to them, what are you doing here? They said, waiting for Muhammad to come out so we can kill him. He said, I saw him walking between you and sprinkling from the dirt on your heads. Everyone started checking his head and they found that soil. And they went seeking the Prophet ﷺ. They brought those experts in footprints to chase the Prophet ﷺ. And they were experts and skillful at that time in that avenue. To the extent they were able to reach the cave. And those who have visited the cave, they know how far that cave is. It's not easy to reach it, but they chased the footprints and they were able to reach that cave. They were very close from it, a few meters away. Then one went to check then he came back. They asked him, what did you do? He said, there is no one there. I saw pigeons. I saw a spider web on the mouth of the cave. So I knew that there is no one inside. No one entered. Inside, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was worried about the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. He was able to see their legs. And he said to the Prophet, if one of them were to look down, he would be able to see us. Then the Prophet wasallam said to Abu Bakr, do not be saddened, for Allah is supporting us. And Allah revealed that verse that, you know, to the Prophet, إِذْ يَقُولُ لِصَاحِبِهِ لَا تَحْزَنْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَنَا That when he tells his companion, do not be saddened, for Allah is supporting us. After three days, after three days, that guide came with the servant of Abu Bakr, with the camels, and the Prophet took him and went to the coastal line heading to Medina. Also, we mentioned that Suraqa ibn Malik followed the Prophet. He is so like a shadow on the coast, and he said, those are the ones, the people of Quraysh are looking for. So he went, and he was hoping for what? For the reward that the people of Quraysh assigned for whoever finds the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam alive or dead, wa'alayhi billah. As he was approaching, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was reciting, and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was worried about the Prophet. When he became very close, the Prophet looked at him and made a dua. O oh Allah, keep his harm away from us with whatever you will. The front legs of that horse, of Suraqa, sank in the sand to its stomach. And that land, they said, where he was standing wasn't soft, was hard, but went inside and he fell. Then he said to the Prophet, make dua for me so I can get my horse out of this. And the Prophet Sallallahu took a promise from him that he will mislead the people of Quraysh. 
from chasing the Prophet. And the Prophet promised him with the bracelets of Kisra. Kisra was the king of Persia at that time. It was a strong empire at that time. So no one would think of beating them. They defeated the Romans at that time. So they were very strong. But the Prophet promised him that you will have the bracelets of Kisra, the king of Persia. That happened during the caliphate of Umar ibn al-Khattab when he became the caliph and the Muslims went to Iraq and they conquered Iraq and they defeated the Persians and they were able to have their hands on the belongings of Kisra. Amongst them were the bracelets of Kisra and he gave them to Suraqa as the Prophet ﷺ promised him. So he agreed. So he came back. On the way back, he saw some people of Quraysh heading in the same direction. He said to them, don't tire yourself. There is no one there. So they went to the other direction. He said, I went out chasing the Prophet ﷺ. I was so keen to find him. I came back and I was hoping that the people of Quraysh will never find him. So the Prophet ﷺ continued his way to Medina. When the Prophet ﷺ arrived to Medina, the people in Medina were waiting for the Prophet ﷺ. Every day they would go out to the outskirts of Medina. Wait and wait and wait. They're waiting for the Prophet ﷺ and his companion to arrive. Then at midday, when the sun becomes so intense, they would head back. Then the following day, they would go to the outskirts of Medina and watch, hoping that they will see the Prophet ﷺ. Until one day, around midday, when it was, yeah, and the sun was in the middle of the sky, one of the non-believers saw the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr. So he called to the Muslims and he said to them, that's your companion that you are waiting for. So they all came out and they welcomed the Prophet ﷺ and he entered al Madina. As he entered al Madina, Atban ibn Malik, one of the companions, amongst men from the clan of Salim, tried to pull the female camel the Prophet ﷺ was riding by its rein to take it where? To, to their place. Because as they used to live as clans, so in this area, like you know how it says suburbs now, it's like suburbs in Medina. That suburb for this clan, that suburb for that clan, and so on. So this person grabbed it. the camel, the Prophet ﷺ was riding the female camel, and he said to the Prophet, stay with us, O Messenger of Allah. We have a big number of people in that clan, and we have the power, so you can stay with us. The Prophet ﷺ said to him, let it go. Do not drag it. Let it go because it is ordered. That female camel is ordered where to go and where to stay. So it continued and it passed by the place where the clan of Sa'ida were. Sa'd ibn Ubadah also approached the Prophet ﷺ and said the same. And the Prophet said to him, leave it, for it is ordered. He also passed by another clan from Al-Haris. Also, they asked him to stay in that suburb. So, until the Prophet ﷺ reached the clan of Al-Najjar, and the clan of Al-Najjar are related to the Prophet ﷺ from his mother's side. From his mother's side. So they said to him, we are 
your maternal uncles, not the direct ones, meaning related from that side. So, and we have the power and we have the number of people, so you can stay with us. And the Prophet وسلم, said, leave it, for it is ordered. And it knows where to stay. So it came to a place for one of the people from the clan of an Najjar, Malik ibn al Najjar, and it stopped there. It stopped there. And that's where the Prophet والسلام, built his mosque. So, and the Prophet والسلام, asked about this place. Who is that place for? And they told him this place is for two orphans from the clan of Malik ibn al Najjar. That was in the middle of the day. When it stayed in that area, it sat down. Khalid ibn Zayd, Abu Ayyub al Ansari, rushed and grabbed the luggage of the Prophet والسلام, and took him to his house. So the first house the Prophet وسلم, went into when he went to Medina was the house of Abu Ayyub al Ansari. Then the Prophet وسلم, heard some ladies from the clan of An Najjar beating the tambourine, you know, the tambourine, beating the tambourine and saying a verse of poetry. نَحْنُ جَوَارٍ مِّن بَنِ النَّجَّارِ يَا حَبَّذَا مُحَمَّدٌ مِّن جَارِ Meaning we are ladies from the clan of an Najjar. How beautiful is it to be a neighbor of Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. Then the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم told them, I love you for the sake of Allah سبحانه وتعالى. Then the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام after he went to the house of Abi Ayyub al-Ansari, one of the companions called Zayd ibn Thabit came to the Prophet وسلم, with some food and bread, something like a soup they used to have, and bread. And he said, this is from my mother to you and to your companion. The Prophet وسلم, said to him, Barakallahu feek. Then after that, Day after day, the companions in Medina used to bring the Prophet وسلم, every day some food for him and for his companions. So when he stayed at Abi Ayyub al-Ansari's house, it was of two levels. His house was of two levels. So he asked the Prophet to go up to stay in there, in the upper level, and the Prophet chose the lower level. When the Prophet chose the lower level, he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, how could I be above you? I don't feel comfortable to be above you and you are underneath. Then the Prophet وسلم, at the beginning chose to be downstairs in the ground level. Then Abu Ayyub would take one side Oh, but not directly above the Prophet والسلام, and he wasn't feeling comfortable until the Prophet والسلام, went up and so Abu Ayyub became down and also the Prophet والسلام, asked about this place where the female camel sat and because they told him that belongs to two orphans he asked about the one who is in charge of them, the custodian for them. And they told him, Mu'az ibn Afra, he was in charge of them. He said, this piece of land belongs to Sahel and Suhail, the sons of Amr, and they are orphans. I can look after them and I can give them something and you make this, you can build your mosque here. Then the Prophet وسلم, refused to take it without any money to be paid to them. Then the Prophet وسلم, asked Abu Bakr عنه, to give him 10 dinars, 
10 dinars. Dinar is a piece of gold, 10 dinar. So he gave them 10 dinars and he took that land and he asked them to start preparing it to build his mosque in that place. They had some palm trees, they removed them, and other trees they removed them, and also uh, some graves were there from the people of the era of ignorance, and he also asked to remove them as well, and they leveled the ground, and he made the, the footings, now you say, for the mosque, and uh, they built like retaining wall all around it. Then he made the size of the mosque about 100 cubits from each side. It was like a square, a square, 100 cubits close to 45 to 50 meters. And also they built all around it with uh, stones all around it. So this is how it was in the past. So see how simple. So they leveled the ground, no carpet, as you are sitting now on, no carpet. They leveled the ground and they built on the like footings around and they built like retaining wall all around. Also, they made the pillars from the palm trees, from the palm trees, and they covered it with branches of palm trees. This is how simple it was. And also the Prophet والسلام, was helping them building that mosque by carrying by himself وسلم, the bricks they had at that time يعني, in that way. And the Prophet was carrying them and he used to say, Allahumma la aisha illa aishu al-akhirah fabarik bil ansari wal muhajira. Meaning the true life is in the hereafter. O oh Allah, bless the people of Mecca, the believers who immigrated with him, called al muhajirun the immigrants. Bless them, bless the immigrants, and bless the supporters of the Prophet wasallam in Medina. Ammar ibn Yasir was carrying more bricks. They, like he was carrying more, so they give him to transport them so they can build, and they gave him more. So he used an expression. He said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, they killed me. Meaning they overloaded me with bricks more than others. They killed me. Then the Prophet wasallam said to him, Rather, you'll be killed by the unjust group. And he was killed, Ammar ibn Yasir, in the Battle of Safin. In the Battle of Safin by the followers of Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. So when he said, they killed me, the Prophet said, no. Those who will kill you are the transgressed group. That group that is transgressed group is the people that will kill you and they are in uh, like uh, in Syria now. Safin is in Syria and he was killed there by the people of Muawiyah. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made the Qibla for the mosque in the direction of Jerusalem because when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went to Medina he was ordered to face Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem for 17 months. Then after that, it was changed to Mecca again. In Mecca, they used to pray to Mecca. So some people may use an expression about Al-Aqsa Mosque. They say that's the first Qibla. It's not the first Qibla because the Prophet faced Mecca first in Mecca. When he went to Medina, he was ordered to face Al-Aqsa in Jerusalem. He did for 17 months, then after that he was ordered to face Mecca again, the Kaaba, where the Kaaba is. And he made for his mosque three entries, three entries. One from the front, one from the back, they call it the door of al rahma mercy. And also another door 
And the third one was the Prophet وسلم, used to enter the mosque through it. Now Abu Ayyub al-Ansari was the Prophet وسلم, stayed with Khalid ibn Zayd was related to the Prophet والسلام, from his mother's side was so keen to help the Prophet and to serve the Prophet He wanted that honor and he got it. He was amongst those who memorized verses of poetry that were said by Tubba' Tubba' al-Awsat, known as As'ad al-Himyari, one of the kings of Yemen at that time. That was before the Prophet والسلام, by more than 600 years. But Tubba', there is a story for him, he's mentioned in the Quran. He came to destroy al Madina at that time because his son was killed. There is a long story. But when he came to destroy al Madina, to destroy the houses, to root out all the palm trees, some went out to meet him from the scholars at that time. They said to him, you won't be able to do so. He said, why? They said to him, this place, meaning Medina, will be the destination of the last prophet. He will come here as an immigrant. When he said, talk to me about Islam, and they talked to him about Islam, and he embraced Islam. So after he embraced Islam, he did a lot of things. He was the first one as well to cover the Kaaba. See the Kaaba, it has a cover now. Not only bricks, it has a cover. He was the first one to cover the Kaaba. And also he was so generous to the people of Medina. And he said verses of poetry. He said, Shahidtu ala Ahmadin annahu Rasulun min Allahi barin nasam Falaw mudda umri ila umrihi Lakuntu waziran lahu wa ibn am Wajahadtu bis sayfi a'da'ahu Wafarrajtu an sadrihi kulla gham Meaning I have testified that Ahmad, because the Prophet was known as Ahmad in the previous books, that he is a messenger from Allah, the creator of the creations. And if I were to remain alive till his time, I will support him. I'll be by his side. And I will fight all those who fight him. And I will try to relieve his chest from any affliction or hardship. So these verses of poetry, the people of Medina, see 600 years before the Prophet came to Medina, started repeating them. Some memorized them. Amongst those who memorized them was Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiyallahu anhu. Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiyallahu anhu. And it was narrated that Abu Ayyub, yeah, he used to give the plate to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the Prophet would eat his food. Then he would see where the Prophet والسلام, touched that plate. He would be keen to know where the Prophet والسلام, by his blessed fingers touched that plate. He would eat from that place and touch it seeking blessings. And one day he realized something on the bead of the Prophet والسلام. So he grabbed it and removed it. So the Prophet liked this from him and how he's taking care of the Prophet Then he said to him, Insha'Allah, Abu Ayyub, no harm will reach you, Insha'Allah Azza wa Jal. So he made that nice supplication for him. Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, as you know, died when he went during Umayyad rulership to conquer Constantinople at that time. And he's now buried in Turkey. Now where he's buried in Turkey. And his grave is so comforting for the one who wants to go and visit it. It's very nice. When you go there, you can feel with tranquility and peace when you are at his grave. Also from the lessons we learn from the Hijrah is to rely on Allah Azza wa Jal. Although some people immigrated from Mecca to Medina 
despite that long distance, 450 kilometers in the heat of the sun in the desert, wasn't easy. The daughter of Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayyit embraced Islam. You know, her father, as we mentioned, was one of the worst enemies of the Prophet. But his daughter embraced Islam. And she was worried about her religion. She asked the Prophet if she can immigrate from Mecca to Medina. He allowed her. She immigrated with her son. Imagine that distance in the heat of the sun. Once she reached Medina, she was resting and her son was there. And he was sick, tired exhausted from that trip, long trip. Then, a bit after that, he died. So they covered him. And they asked her, rely on Allah Azza wa Jal and seek the reward from Allah Azza wa Jal for this calamity. Then she said, did my son die? They said, yes. Then she raised her hands and she said, oh Allah, you know that I haven't immigrated from Mecca to Medina except for your sake and the sake of being with your Prophet to fulfill this obligation. Do not inflict me with such a calamity and make the enemies of Islam feel happy about this calamity. Then they realized that that sheet that they covered him with started moving. He took it off. He was brought back to life. And he remained alive until the caliphate of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. So he lived for years after that, after she made that supplication. Also from the lessons we learn about how to bear the hardship, what happened with Umm Ayman al-Habashiyya. She used to look after the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. And also she immigrated from Mecca to Medina. And she was fasting and she had no water. Now, around Maghrib time, sunset time, she was about to die from thirst. Then she looked up, she saw a bucket filled with water with a very white rope attached to it. That was from paradise. She took it, she drank that water, and that quenched her thirst. What she said after that, she said, I used to fast in very, very, very hot days without feeling thirsty at all. Without feeling thirsty at all. And she would go to Mecca to make tawaf also in a very hot day and without experiencing any thirst. While others may be very thirsty just because she drank from that water. Also amongst the lessons that we learn what happened with At-Tufayl ibn Amr al-Dawsi. He immigrated from Mecca to Medina and he had someone with him from his tribe. When they reached Al-Medina, he became sick, and he couldn't bear the pain of that sickness. He had an arrow with him, with wide tip for it. He used it, and he chopped off some of his fingers. He started bleeding until he died. Then his friend, At-Tufayl ibn Amr, saw him in a dream that he was in a good state. He asked him about his situation. He said, Allah forgave me because I immigrated to the Prophet ﷺ. Then he realized that his hand was wrapped. He said, what about your hand? What happened to it? He said, it was said to me that we won't fix what you have ruined. When he went to the Prophet والسلام, and he told him about what happened with him, the Prophet raised his hands and said, O oh Allah, and forgive him for his hands as well. And this was mentioned in Sahih Muslim under a title that the one who kills himself is not a blasphemer. 
The one who commits suicide is committing the most enormous sin after blasphemy. Because the most enormous sin out of all of them is blasphemy. And the one who dies as a blasphemer won't be forgiven by Allah Azza wa Jal. After blasphemy, in the second rank comes killing oneself or a Muslim unjustly. So he committed that enormous sin and the Prophet asked Allah to forgive him. They said because he didn't die as a blasphemer. So that shows although he killed himself, but Allah forgave him because of the blessings of the immigration that he made from Mecca to Medina to fulfill that obligation and to follow the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Also from the lessons we learn from the Hijrah as well, how to dedicate our life to work for the hereafter, not for this life. Because in the eyes of the companions, this life meant nothing to them. That's why they were very strong. Although they had basic, basic life, but they were able to spread Islam east and west. Because their target was the hereafter, not this perishing world. Suhaib, Suhaib al-Rumi, came to Mecca and asked, if he can stay there, they allowed him. And he started working. He was smart, good tradesman, and he was able to collect a big wealth. He became rich. When the Prophet والسلام, ordered the believers to immigrate to Medina, he wanted to leave. So he was packing up to leave to Medina. The non-believers obstructed him. They said to him, what are you doing? He said, I want to go to Medina. They said to him, you came to us and you were very poor. Then we let you work and you did a lot of work. You collected this wealth. You think now we're going to let you go with all that wealth? He did not hesitate for a second to say to them, see if I give you everything. I've collected. Would you let me go? Now once, because you know, the, the hearts are attached to money, to this dunya, his heart was attached to the hereafter. He said to them, see if I give you everything, all my belongings, all my properties, everything, would you let me go? They said, yes. He said, take it. Then the Prophet wasallam said about him, Indeed, Suhaib has won. Indeed, Suhaib has won. He made a good bargain. And he purchased the hereafter, purchased paradise, because his heart was looking towards gaining paradise, not towards any worldly pleasure that will perish. Soon or later, it will perish. So their hearts were attached to the hereafter. And subhanAllah, in one of the hadith, the Prophet wasallam said, amongst those who love me the most are people who will come after me. Meaning not from his companions. They come after him, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. One of them is ready to give away his family and wealth for the sake of seeing me. For the sake of seeing me. We love the Prophet And we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to gather us with the Prophet on the Day of Judgment. And we ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to make us amongst those who enter paradise without prior torture, ameen, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. We say la ilaha illallah and make salah on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.